and um, thank you for this opportunity today. My name is Lin Jun Jiang. Good afternoon. And my topic today is about um, it's about a Japanese contemporary artist who does who is a mischievous genius and who does pseudo activist art. In July 2015, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo featured a public show titled. An exhibition for children. Whose place is this? Certainly, works display at this museum would have been children friendly. However, not long after its opening, the show had troubles. The museum received complaints from certain visitors about one specific artwork titled Get Manifesto, and the museum was going to take down this work. Even though the museum later decided to keep the artwork on display. This incident caused an outrage on social media like Tumblr and Twitter. It probably was not common for a public exhibition for children to receive complaints and work, and the work was almost about to be taken down. Yet, it would not be strange for this specific artwork because it was made by the, by the controversial artist Makoto Aida. So it's this guy, <laughs> widely considered to be a mischievous genius. Ida has been creating experimental but often problematic works in various forms, drawing inspiration from historical, social, and political contexts. Ida jokingly calls himself a genius, but he is rather considered to be a mischievous one. Quote, a man of chaos and disorder. Um, end quote. It was named by Mami Kataoka, the chief curator at Mori Art Museum, Tokyo. Ida works with a diversity of media, and he is highly capable of working with refined skills, such as in this painting, Jungle of 100 Flowers, which was also displayed at the Armory Show 2017 in New York. He favors abstract expressionism and conceptual art as well. And this painting is is really a um, huge scale acrylic painting. Besides his diverse styles and techniques, Ida is known for his topics in artworks related to Japanese society, history, political issues, as well as nonsensical, erotic, and grotesque themes. Ida's works, just like Kataoka, the chief curator at Modi Art Museum, says, they are full of confusion and complexity. Kataoka also comments that the chaos and disorder brought by, brought by Ida could be seen as a pro, quote microcosm offers a direct reflection of the multifaceted complexity, contradictions, and ambiguity found in Japanese society and culture." End quote. Although his works often lack a sense of seriousness, either pseudo-activist arts are not simply nonsense parody. Instead, through his many artworks like installations, performances of fake protests and demonstrations, Ida holds a playful and mischievous attitude towards art making, and he states critical about the social and international atmosphere. An early piece can be traced back to 1995, when the bubble economy in Japan collapsed, and Ida himself was in poverty as an emerging artist. As an emerging artist. Seeing the homeless building cardboard shelters in Shinjuku, Ida managed to build a cardboard installation at no cost, which was this, the Shinjuku Castle piece. In Japan, a castle can symbolize power and splendor of a feudal lord, and people describe a house built with great effort as a castle. Ida intended to, to let this work to be a nonsense humor, hoping that some of the homeless would move into the house. However, it was only in four days that the installation was removed promptly by the government. It was also due to the collapsing economy in the 90s when the city hall moved to Shinjuku and the homeless nearby became conspicuous. Although Ida had his original intention as a nonsensical and gratu gratuitous ins installation in public, this artwork showed concern and pointed out the social problems between the government and the homeless at the time. And then in 2000, Ida launched a protest called Your Pronunciation is Wrong. It was on Washington Square in New York. Though it was a parody and funny one, during the time, Ida was an artist in residence in New York. He, quote, had no choice but to confront the globalization of the world and English as a global language, end quote. 
Yet before his trip, he had already expressed some discon discontent towards English, international communication, and globalism, saying that he wanted to, quote, confirm that English is by no means a global language, end quote. Ida's protest about just justifying Chinese accent and pronunciation in English was not a serious one, but his ideas seemed critical about the phenomenon of the dominating and globalizing English language. Ida's nonsensical perception on art and social issues continued in another performing project, Demonstration Machine for One Person, in 2002. The so-called Demonstration Machine, as shown in the slide, hit a, hit a device that could chant out funny voice when the speaker said some slogan with the microphone. So the performance created a ridiculous scene of a lonely demonstrator followed by a bunch of wrecked hand, wrecked handmade dolls protesting with him. So the machine works like if you channel something in the microphone and then the bunch of tiny people in the, this kind of poorly made tiny people in, on, on this machine, they would channel out funny voices like, um, like you suck in, in helium. So it creates a very funny but also ironic scene. So the point of, um, of his piece, um, this futile act, seemed like a joke, but also revealed a reality quandary that the voice of minorities is less heard by the majority, and they have to continue fighting alone for their rights with little awareness raised. Here comes the funny videos. Well, maybe not funny, but. <laughs> Furthermore, touching on social and political issues, Ida's Ida also had worked with video making in which he disguised himself as some political figures and made nonsensical speech. The 2005 video, the video of a man calling himself Bin Laden staying in Japan, um, the top image, showed the fake Bin Laden, um, Ida, which Ida disguised, sitting at a warm and cute Japanese table drinking sake and talking about how he liked a peaceful Japan. The unrealistic setting of the video was Quote, so detached in the political, physical, and psychological sense from the reality of the September 11 attacks, end quote, commented by Kataoka. By showing this detachment from the global political environment, Ida points out the ambiguous, posi ambiguous position of Japan in the global context, as well as the mental distance between the, quote, peaceful life in Japan and the, intense interne and the tense international situation. End quote. Another one was a video in 2014 and 2015 entitled The Video of Man Calling Himself Japan's Prime Minister Making a Speech at the International Assembly, as the image shown on the bottom. Ida dre dressed in a similar manner to Shinzo Abe, the current Prime Minister of Japan, and he made a speech apologizing for Japan's role in the Pacific War. While the real Prime Minister avoided doing so in a speech earlier, Ida's mockery seemed to create a satirical and alternative reality that criticized Prime Minister's speech. Whenever Ida's making art with social or political themes, it appears that he always takes a certain lighthearted approach. Maybe he just wants to make a mischievous statement like a clever but alienated bad boy and see how viewers and critiques will react. But at the same time, through these provocative words, Ida is able to reveal problems and raise the awareness from the audience. When the public thought that they had understood Ida's art, Ida's art practice, Ida again made something that went against or beyond the viewer's expectation. As mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, recently, um, recently in 2015, Ida with his wife and son together made the installation Manifesto. The piece was for a public show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo for children to visit during their summer vacation. However, to older generations, this format of this piece, as a manifesto written in ink on cloth, reminded them of a radical left-wing protest in the 1970s. Ida's display became controversial among adult viewers, and the rumor that the museum was going to take down the work soon spread throughout the internet. However, if the viewers inspect the work more carefully, they will find that this political related format actually has written nothing about specific political figures or views, 
but rather the content was based on the Ida on the Ida family's daily random talks. And it was just complaints about the Ministry of Education in Japan. And such as like the textbook shouldn't be censored. Um, we need more time to play rather than doing homework. So it's just like really um, random village chance. In fact, Ida's work manifesto was receiving positive reviews on social media, celebrating the freedom of speech against art censorship. And it was later revealed that only one anonymous viewer complained about the work. But the museum was too sensitive to the public. Then the outrage on social media continued debating about art censorship and whether it was right for the museum to remove this piece. Ida himself also responded on his Tumblr. The now deleted because he switched to Twitter these days. And the response, Ida justified his intention of the work that he wanted to show a specific point of view from a random family regarding to the issues in the Ministry of Education. And through this work, he hoped to deliver the message to young viewers that there is no need to, no need to suppress one's voice in a conversation about social issues. Quote, Whoever a person is, they should never be afraid to talk about and share their opinions. This is the ideal and principle of democracy. End quote. <coughs> Therefore, this piece is like Ida's former artworks that parody protests and demonstrations in an exaggerated and humorous way. But they also deliver critical messages about contemporary issues. It's formed like a writing for a political protest by attracting adult audience into relating the work to political content. But for children, the content of this work reads just like daily random chit chat and complaints. This contrast can raise a laugh if the viewers get the joke. And this time, besides getting adult audience to think, he participated in public art show for children, and he expanded his audience group. Ida's intention actually ironically fits perfectly in the description of the exhibition on the website of the Museum of Contemporary Art Tokyo, which was once going to take down Ida's work. The description goes, quote, the exhibition can be said to represent intersections between society and self. You will find yourself confronted with the various problems we need to consider in order to live in the future, such as the, glo such as the global environment, education, freedom, etc. End quote. Therefore, Ida's work, Manifesto, I consider it a pseudo-activist protest, which in fact functions to encourage the younger generation to have critical thinking skills and to consider various problems in the society today. The mischievous genius, the mischievous genius Makoto Aida, presents his unique way of art making that uses exaggeration and dark humor. He presents some of his works as activist protest and demonstration, but all he intends is to raise a laugh. But more importantly, he wants to engage the viewers and encourage them to think about the issues relate, related to a to a broader context. His early public installation, Shinjibu Castle, related a uh, review the homeless problem in cities. The performing artwork, Your Pronunciation is Wrong, in New York, criticized the globalism of English language. Another performance, Demonstration Machine for One Person, shows the helplessness for minorities in a society that cannot make their voice heard. Moreover, Ida's video works, mounting political figures like Bin Laden and Shinzo Abe, aim to point out Japan's lack of participation in the global context. And through Ida's recent work, Manifesto, he includes a younger group of audiences and, and encourages them to participate in conversation concerning about the social environment surrounding them. Although ridiculous and malicious at first, at first glance, Ida uses his uses his words to implicitly point out related social political issues while raising a laugh with their dark humor. Taking his unique perspective, Ida brings his intentional pseudo-active artworks to the public, provoking laughter, but also evoking debates and questions about how art can function within and impact on its contemporary environment. Last but not the least, speaking of an artist as a public figure on social media, Ida himself, as an active Twitter user, he tweets a lot, sharing his opinions about political and social issues on his account. 
and just last year, he cooperated with an activist organization in Tokyo, holding a talk, sh holding a talk show on YouTube, filming himself at the Kabuki show, interacting with passerby, exchanging thoughts regarding to various topics. Most of his audiences were young adults, so you can see how he how he is expanding his audience group via social media. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Jeremy Dollar repeats time and again that his goal with his participatory art practice is to create conversations. While most of the work for this British conceptual artist, known best for his installations and video work, centers on politics, the works themselves maintain an ambiguous stance regarding the politics they address, letting viewers interpret it however they see fit. One such politically flavored work is The Battle of Orgreave in 2001, a reenactment of a violent clash that occurred during the 1984 minor strike in Yorkshire. Repercussions from this minor strike are still felt by and discussed by Britons today. So though the work itself has absolutely no defined political perspective, there is still a political discourse that follows it, whether it is discussed by art critics or the artist himself. This discourse acts as a catalyst for conversation, giving participants an opportunity to include the work in their own way, rather than one orchestrated by the artist. Documentation of the work, as well as critical analyses, articles on political climates, and the artist's own words, can be used to explore the ways in which this reenactment interacts with the places where it is exhibited. Jeremy Dollar's The Battle of War Group not only creates conversations related to the politics of the 1984 strike, it also remains relevant more than a decade after its performance by interacting with the local politics of the museums and galleries where it is featured. This first photo is from the 1984 minor strike of police manhandling a striker. The Battle of Orgreave originally was a violent clash between police and striking miners outside of the Orgreave Cody plant, notable for the excessive force used by police towards the virtually unarmed miners, including dogs, horses, and riot tactics. It occurred on June 18, 1984. Very few things are known for sure about what took place. Conflicting stories coupled with biased media coverage have confused the timeline of events, as has the passage of time. The BBC has admitted that the coverage they aired about the Battle of War Group was not impartial. It started out as a peaceful strike. Occasionally stones were thrown by strikers, but police recount playing games with the strikers and taking naps in the field most of the time, until one day they were told to come with riot gear and armored police, or mounted police, I'm sorry. This shows an image from the day of the Battle of Orgreave of all the police and their riot gear lined up and then the handful of strikers, apparently. One of the police officers involved describes the way his police force was essentially militarized, as well as the way police forces brought in from other cities were excessively violent towards the protesters. This photo on the left is one of the most popular photos from the original minor strike was taken by John Harris, and it shows a mounted police officer that I believe was from another area um, actually trying to hit a reporter rather than a striker. And then the photo on the right is just another person being wrestled down by four police officers at once. At the end of the day on June 18th, 93 picketers were arrested, but their charges were dropped because so many of the statements from the South Yorkshire police were too similar. Inquests have revealed that many officers had their statements narrated to them. A further inquiry into the actions of the police at Orgreave has been denied as recently as October of 2016. Then this image is from Jeremy Deller's reenactment in 2001. This is one of the more popular ones from his reenactment. Deller is open about the image that originally inspired his artwork. On 18th June 1984, I was watching the evening news and saw footage of a mass picket at the Orgreave cooking plant in South Yorkshire in which thousands of them were chased up the field by mounted police. The image of this pursuit stuck in my mind and for years I wanted to find out what exactly happened on that day with the view to reenacting or commemorating it in some way. The resulting reenactment was held on June 17, 2001, consisting of approximately 800 people from reenactment societies and 200 volunteers, many of whom were involved in the 1984 battle. 
The inclusion of the Battle Reenactment Societies was an ingenious move on Delic's part. These reenactors not only brought skill, but as, as Claire Bishop notes in Artificial Hells, it symbolically elevated the relatively recent events at Wargroup to the status of English history. This, in turn, gives the action credence as an artwork, rather than the Battle of Wargroup being dismissed as a form of political protest with only volunteers like the president. This shows several images from the reenactment. The most important aspect of the Battle of Wargroup, though, is the fact that it did not operate in a field already neutralized by official history. Instead of reenacting battles that are hundreds of year old, years old, this action wants a battle that many living people not only participated in, but in which many are still ashamed of their involvement. And this shows another clash between the police and the striking miners and Deller's reenactment. Deller has said, I was interested in delving into unresolved recent histories and approaching them from a slightly unorthodox position. I was not so much trying to recuperate the recent past as dig up a festering body and give it a proper postmortem, however unpleasant that may sound. I was not interested in healing the wounds of the strike, as some commenters have subsequently written or speculated. Rather, I wanted to reopen the wounds, if anything, and the miners who participated in the reenactment knew this as it was always a part of our discussion. The Battle of Orgreep has what Claire Bishop refers to as a multiple ontology. The live event on June 17, 2001, a film of the event directed by Mike Figgis that was aired in 2002, Deller's publication of the, event, of the research he conducted, The English Civil War Part Two, which includes essays from miners, police, paramedics, and others, and an archive in the Tate Britain Election, entitled The Battle of Wargreave, An Injury to One is an Injury to All. But Bishop fails to acknowledge the life of the art work beyond these art angels sponsored facets. Articles written about the work, conversations between viewers or readers about one or more of these facets, or the life of the work within classrooms. Deller likes losing control of his work, which is exactly what happened as soon as the Battle of Wargreave reached the public sphere. Even before the action itself, the artist was talking about it, creating verbal conversations. This conversational legacy has grown exponentially over the decade and a half since the work took place. Conversation in relation to the Battle of Wargreave is not only literal, but includes all interchange of thoughts and words. Deller's work has a very particular discourse surrounding it, involving trade union politics, labor strikes, and police brutality, Yet the examples of this discourse are very specific. While another artist wanting to make a work about labor unions might look at multiple violent strikes in multiple countries to make the work universal, Deller was interested in one specific clash at one specific location during one specific strike. The broader discourse, however, of a state turning against its laborers, striking, and police brutality has given the battle of orgery relevance that even Deller could not have predicted. The political discourse of the work engages with and exchanges ideas with political discourse elsewhere. Despite the extreme specificity of the reenactment, the work has generated responses and contexts far beyond what Deller initially imagined. In 2015, a museum in Spain and another in Mexico collaborated to present the infinitely variable ideal of the popular, Deller's first solo exhibition in Spanish-speaking countries. While the Battle of Wargrave is not the only piece that was exhibited, most of the essays in the accompanying exhibition catalog are on this topic, meaning that it was an important one. However, none of the essays address local politics or how or why the piece could be relevant to the Spanish or Mexican museum visitors. The political situation in both countries, while not perfect mirrors of the situation in South Yorkshire during the 1984 minor strike, have a lot of similarities. Less than two weeks before the infinitely variable ideal of the popular open in Spain, a story group detailing the fact that Spanish police tortured over 6,000 people in the span of a decade. Additionally, in 2012, police forces went overboard in their responses to protesters, pulling out riot gear and using excessive force because protesters had been throwing stones at them. In 2015, the Mexican farming community began striking for wage increases and improved work conditions. Like the minor strike, this one was mostly peaceful until the police chose to use rubber bullets and tear gas one day. Protesters said that police smashed down doors and windows to break into their homes early in the morning with no warning and shot people at close range with rubber bullets. 
The situations in both countries have the same symptoms as we've seen in the protests at the Orgreave Cooking Plant in 1984. These similarities would not have been missed by the informed viewer in either Mexico or Spain, whether the museums pointed them out or not. The police state atmospheres of Spain and Mexico would have made it dangerous to host an exhibition about Spanish or Mexican police brutality, but the distance of time and location from these countries to Orgreave acts as a buffer. As it stands, the presence of the Battle of Orgreave in each of these countries acts as a political commentary, not exactly explicit, but not nearly implicit either. Hal Foster suggests Deller's vision of historical reenactment is modeled on the song cover, which Deller describes as a social adaptation. Such an adaptation puts the past in play again, and does so for the future. Supporting this assertion of keeping the events in Orgreave in play, Deller affirms that he was still receiving responses to the Battle of Orgreave as recently as 2014. The ways the events of June 18, 1984 have been echoed around the world are essential to the Battle of Orgreave's longevity as well, making it unintentionally relevant in countries to which Deller could never have dreamed it would travel. Surprisingly, the Battle of Orgreave has not traveled to the United States in an official capacity. Other works by Deller have. It is what it is, conversations about Iraq from 2009, where Deller towed a vehicle destroyed by a car bomb in Iraq around in the Deep South, would not have worked in any country but the United States. The Battle of Orgreave would be a fitting exhibition for a variety of reasons, all of which can be exemplified by just one example of the events that occurred in Ferguson, Missouri in August 2014. Police responded to protests of Michael Brown's shooting with riot squads, tear gas, flash grenades, and armored vehicles. It took two days for the crisis in Ferguson to make it onto cable news. Once it did, much of the information was incorrect or biased. But the news spread via social media, and that is how the biased information was brought to the attention of new organizations. Like Deller and Tins, the Battle of Orgreave can create conversation in the United States too. The Battle of Orgreave is more important conceptually than it could ever be visually. To someone without the conceptual background, the reenactment on June 17, 2001 would look like any other battle reenactment, just slightly more modern. Bishop notes that its conceptualization is too idiosyncratic and controversial ever to be initiated by socially responsible institutions. In short, the Battle of Orgreave's potency derives from its singularity rather than from its exemplarity as a replicable model. Deller stepped back to see what would happen if he did a reenactment of one specific event, but its viewers derived their own opinions. The work would not be successful a second time if it were changed to be a reenactment of protests in other countries, which is why it is important that Deller's original work stayed in the public eye. The Battle of Warbury was created to generate conversations, and as long as it keeps traveling, conversations will keep happening.